All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight, presented by FanDuel here at The Volume. Happy Sunday, everybody. I hope all of you guys are having a great weekend. Not going to go too long today because I'm away from the studio, but I'm going to hit on the three big nationally televised games from the last two days. We're going to hit Warriors-Lakers, which just went down. Then we're going to hit Suns-Mavs in that crazy clutch showdown with KD hitting the game winner. And then we're going to finish up with the Sixers getting a signature win on the road in Milwaukee last night. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore JasonLT so you guys don't miss any show announcements. Last but not least, if for whatever reason you guys miss one of these videos and you can't get back over to YouTube to finish, don't forget you can find them wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. All right, let's talk some basketball. So the Lakers get a huge win at home over the Golden State Warriors. I I thought the story of this game was the ball handling differential between the Lakers guards kind of just piecing together what a primary ball handler looks like versus kind of an uneven day from Jordan Poole in particular. Uh, But I do want to start with AD because he was an absolute monster on both ends of the floor in this game and he deserves the most credit. 39 points on 25 shots countless important baskets down the stretch in the short roll and in isolation he took much better care of the basketball than he did against Minnesota which is a huge uh, plot store uh, plot line in this game for the Lakers guards in particular and he completely and utterly locked down the paint held the Warriors to just 26 points in the paint in this game went with a similar uh, scheme to what they've used against the Warriors in the last couple of matchups, ignoring the non-shooters, trying to deny and top lock the off-ball shooters. The Warriors did a much better job in this game of getting separation from those top locks. They got a lot of open shots curling around. Steph got hot in the fourth quarter and they had to start chasing him off the line and started to open up some things at the rim. But for the most part, Anthony Davis did an amazing job locking down the paint. And on the biggest position, Possession of the game, a straight face up ISO against Draymond Green on that left block. You know, when I've been critical of him over the years of settling for jumpers a lot in those situations, he just ripped through to the baseline. And again, Draymond is probably, if not the best, one of the very best defenders at his position in the league. Didn't settle, ripped through the baseline, went through that uh, that little push shot that he always goes to uh, where he just kind of reaches up over the top of the defense and kind of shoots like a floater. And I've said a lot um, in recent weeks, like that's when you can tell when Anthony Davis is really locked in is when he's making that little push shot, that floater. He had another big one in the short roll where he hit a floater over, Lo- uh, over Looney down the stretch. That's that same type of shot just in a short roll situation instead of in an ISO situation. That's when you can tell that Anthony Davis is really locked in. And, it, and he, he he made all the big plays down the stretch of this game to get the win. So tip of the cap to him. You know, I've said with AD a bunch, but this is such a great opportunity for him to to prove his MVP value. Because this Lakers team, if they can get healthy, if they can get D'Angelo Russell out there, if they can get LeBron James out there, they are good. Not just good, but a legitimate threat in the Western Conference. But it doesn't matter if they don't make it out of this play-in tournament scramble situation. And the only way they're going to do that with D'Angelo Russell taking his sweet time getting back from an ankle injury and Anthony Davis, or excuse me, LeBron James being out with his foot injury, they need Anthony Davis to produce at an all-world level. And for the most part, He's been doing that. It's been a little uneven from time to time, but he's done what he's needed to do to notch a couple of wins here. And, and you know, uh, it's specifically like that Minnesota Timberwolves win, that's a tough one. That's one that, especially with all of the other things that broke right for them in the standings you need, but winning this one against Golden State, which I didn't think they'd be able to win without D'Angelo Russell. So major shout out to them. It kind of undoes some of the damage from that loss to Minnesota. But again, I said the story of this game was the the collective ball handling of the Lakers. Austin Reeves, Lonnie Walker, Dennis Schroeder, and Malik Beasley. They took way better care of the basketball than they did against uh, Minnesota. Nine total turnovers. Those four guys combined for 46 points and 17 assists. That's cobbling together primary ball handling. Austin Reeves in particular was amazing. 16 points, 8 assists in just 28 minutes. Only two turnovers. Made a, made a huge three on the left wing in the fourth quarter. Just in general, um, you know, again, I like him slotted better as kind of like a second side guy as that fifth starter, um, especially in clutch situations and running bench groups. But all of these guys, 
all four of these guys have been put in a tough spot because with D'Angelo Russell being out and with LeBron James being out, every single one of them is kind of underqualified, so to speak, for what they're being asked to do filling those roles. And particularly in the Thunder win when Anthony Davis sat out, and in this game against the Warriors, I thought all of those guys stepped up and made big plays to help them win a game they shouldn't have been able to win. Um, one last uh, Laker I wanted to shout out was Troy Brown Jr. Uh, he hit a bunch of super important threes, including one on the right wing there down the stretch that wasn't even open, just rose up and knocked it down. That's a That is a confident, you know, like audacity type of shot that you love to see from a guy. And I think it's a great example of the benefit of having the pedigree that Troy Brown has. He's a former lottery pick who's now operating in a smaller role on a veteran minimum contract. But that is a player who earlier in his basketball career had the ball in his hands a lot and has a lot of confidence and he leaned on it in that moment. Um, On the Warriors front, I thought Steph was better than I expected him to be. Um, he uh, usually struggles with rhythm in these types of games. Didn't struggle uh, as nearly as much as I expected to. Usually when he comes back from injury, there's that three, four game kind of like get back up to speed, get the timing right on everything before he really starts clicking. And he was pretty good right away. The Warriors made several runs in this game. I'm sure as a Warriors fan, it was frustrating for you guys watching because it was like they just kept getting right back to within one and then the Lakers would go on a run. And then they'd get back to with one and then the Lakers would go on a run. That happened like seven or eight times in this game. The, the one guy in particular I thought really struggled today was Jordan Poole. And specifically on the last big Lakers run when they uh, were in the middle of the fourth quarter, I thought Jordan Poole took a couple of really bad shots um, early in possessions without really having his feet set that I thought sprung those Laker, uh, that final Laker run to get them back into the lead. Now, some of it's to be expected. You know, this is a guy who's been starting a lot of this season as a result of the Steph Curry injuries, and it's a complete role shift. Not only is he coming off the bench, he's running with different groups, plays that when he's on the floor with Steph, suddenly plays that were run for him are being run for Steph. So I, I, I want to cut him some slack from the standpoint of just having that wrench thrown into everything. But I thought that him in particular, Particular, that gap between like Austin Reeves' production today and Jordan Poole was a huge swing factor in a game that the Warriors should have won. Um, all right, let's move on to Suns Mavs. So I only caught the fourth quarter of this one, um, but I'm going to watch the rest tomorrow morning. And if I see anything specifically interesting, we'll cover it in tomorrow's show. We have Knicks Celtics tonight too. That game we're going to be covering tomorrow as well. So a ton of good stuff to get into in tomorrow's show. But the Suns win 130 to 126. KD hits the game winner with 11 seconds left. You know, it was an interesting counter from KD on that possession because the Mavs doubled him on almost all of his touches, especially on like... Uh, high post, low post, like catch and triple threat type of situations. They were double teaming him. And on this particular possession, he's kind of dribbling out front against Tim Hardaway Jr. at the logo. And Kyrie Irving just hard doubles uh, from the right wing. And what he did, which I thought was really smart, is he made the swing pass to Ish Wainwright, and then that caused Kyrie to recover. And then when he got the ball back, he did a rip through away from the double team. So he took the double team out as an option by going quickly in the opposite direction. The Dallas defense was set up to double from Kyrie's side. And by, Ky- and by KD ripping through and going the other way, Kyrie kind of meandered in that direction, like kind of soft, like chasing him like he was going to double, but he would have had to sprint to get there in time. And that allowed KD to operate one-on-one. And he just hit that classic dribble pull-up jump shot that he's made so many times in his career and that he's been hitting at an insane rate this season. Uh, Kevin Durant is shooting a 60% effective field goal percentage on pull-up jump shots this year. How freaking insane is that? That's pull-up off the dribble jump shots, one of the toughest shots in the league, counting uh, when you add the weight of three-point shots and their value, a 60% effective field goal percentage, which was just insane. Then Luka goes down and he smokes an easy layup. Um, but the, a Devin Booker comes in and has a little moment as, at his expense. And I, I tweeted about this, but like, again, I, I like Devin Booker for the record. So this is not me um, uh, coming after him uh, uh, in, that, in the sense that you would think. But to be honest, like, I thought it was kind of lame that, you know, Luka literally went into your house in a playoff series and embarrassed you. And in a regular season game where Kevin Durant hits the game winner, you're going to start talking shit to Luka at that point. Like that just, 
I mean, again, uh, some of it, that's just Devin Booker's personality. He's a shit talker. He does that all the time. Um, but it did come off kind of lame when it's like, okay, you brought in maybe the best player in the world to win a battle for you. And then you're going to talk shit when literally Luca just embarrassed you on the bigger stage, not a regular season stage, but literally a playoff stage when you were the one seed in the conference. It's, it was definitely a little bit weird, but the Suns late game offense was super interesting. Like I said, they were doubling KD on the catch and they got a lot of really wide open shots out of that ish Wainwright and CP three in particular actually missed a couple of wide open shots down the stretch of this game. So their offense, they were generating extremely high quality shots. There was a quote, I think it was from the last game, uh, the bulls game. Um, I can't remember who the reporter was, so I apologize for not getting this right. But somebody questioned him on just how he's been handling the doubles. And KD said something in the presser that's been something that I've talked about a lot, which is if like your job as a primary initiator is not necessarily to shoot every time or to get the assist. It's to draw that second defender to create that initial advantage that the other basketball t- players on your team can further the advantage and get that truly great shot, right? And... Um, Katie straight up said that after the uh, 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 um, uh, when he was questioned about it and basically said like I I understand that my role is to draw that second defender and from there he said in the in the quote he's like from there we can play that's when basketball starts is the way he framed it and that's the thing is like when you have that four on three now it's that drive and kick basketball and guys making reads but you need to get the basketball to start and the only way the basketball is going to start is if you're best player or whoever your primary initiator is can draw that second defender in to start that four on three action but even when the Mavs got misses they couldn't close out the defensive possession the Mavs got two stops in the final minute of that game they forced CP3 into a miss at the foul line Devin Booker missed like a driving floating bank shot and on both of them DeAndre Ayton kept the possession alive on the first one he drew a foul and then on the second one, uh, when Booker shot that driving bank shot, he drew Powell into help. And as a result, that left Kyrie and Luka to contend with DeAndre Ayton under the basket, which is a battle they're going to lose almost every single time. He ended up getting the offensive rebound put back. And again, like this is this is if, if you have real size and athleticism at the forward position, then you can crack down from the wing and you have a chance of winning that rebounding battle. But this is a team that just doesn't have that athleticism. Like if Maxi Kleba or Dwight Powell are drawn in to a ball handler driving to the basket, everyone around them is going to be a guard or Luca who's not a great athlete. So you're not going to win a lot of those contested rebound battles. That's just the reality of Dallas's predicament. Kyrie and Luca were both magnificent down the stretch of this game. They went blow for blow with the Suns, but the Suns got two additional opportunities because of a physical disadvantage in the front court in the form of DeAndre Ayton. It's impossible to win games, or I shouldn't say impossible, but it's going to make it so much harder to win games when you're asking your players to be nearly perfect because the other team has more margin for error because of their physical advantages. This game swung on Phoenix getting two additional shots because of two box out situations where the the Mavericks couldn't uh, contend physically. And the, and the reality is, is that problem will only get exacerbated when they get into the um, postseason. I'm going to dive into the film of this one tomorrow, and if I see anything else interesting, we'll call uh, um, we'll dive into it in tomorrow's show. So the Sixers get a signature win on the road in Milwaukee, 133 to 130. Um, I've said a half dozen times on the show in the last few months that I've been super impressed with uh, the fight. Just that like competitive energy and and that like we're in the trenches together and we're going to find a way to win this game type of energy that I've seen from James Harden and Joel Embiid. Not just on a night in and night out basis, but especially in these major nationally televised games. Even in that game they lost against Boston, like they battled down the stretch of that game and made a lot of big plays. And you know what? You lost to a really good team on a really tough shot, which is going to happen sometimes uh, from Jason Tatum. But I've been impressed with their battle a lot this season and and you know last night went on the road to what I think is the best team in the league in the Milwaukee Bucks and both James Harden and Joel Embiid outplayed Giannis to notch yet another signature win for them um, I wanted to start with the shift to start the fourth quarter so the Bucks were up double digits and Harden's running the bench group and he got them back into the game on both ends of the floor on one end of the floor he's guarding Giannis and on the other end of the floor 
just making Milwaukee pay for their base shell principle defensive scheme. Like uh, I t- I've talked a lot when we talked about uh, Michael Porter Jr. about having a tall player on the weak side who is an aggressive and dead eye shooter. When you have that, it makes even shell drill principles you know useless because the idea of shell drills like if the ball's on the opposite side of the floor and i'm guarding the shooter i am going to position myself several steps away from the shooter to be ready to help if i need to right but when you have these super aggressive tall shooters a rifle pass into the shooting pocket i can't rotate in time not enough not in time to bother that shot and james harden time and time again to start the fourth quarter of this game was making that swing pass across the court, just like Jokic does to Michael Porter Jr., but to Georges Niang, and he was knocking him down. And that was the offensive side of the run. On the other end of the floor, James Harden held his own, more than held his own against Giannis. There was a play where Giannis got to the foul line, but for the most part, he held his own. Now, that's not something that you're going to go to in large doses in a playoff series. Giannis would figure that out, and, and he would barbecue him. But in small doses like that, Harden has some physical advantages. He's built like a truck. He's got a low center of gravity. He's really hard to move off his spot. He's always been a good post defender. Some of you guys might remember in that first Elam ending game in the All-Star game when James Harden was having some success guarding Giannis Antetokounmpo on the post, right? At the end of the day, um, like that, that just sliding your feet, having that taking that contact in the chest, having the strength to hold your ground, that will at least force Giannis to make shots over the top. They're going to be easier shots because he has such a height advantage, but it's going to make him make shots over the top. And Giannis has struggled making shots over the top this year. And James Harden got a bunch of stops there. But the bench unit basically erased a double-digit lead. Milwaukee punched back. Um, Brooke Lopez was incredible down the stretch of this game, hit a huge three, had like a really nifty kind of under the rim layup on Joel Embiid, made a nice play in the short roll to Drew Holiday in the weak side corner. He was magnificent, but J- James Harden and Joel Embiid just went blow for blow with the Bucks every possession down the stretch of this game. Harden was beating Chris Middleton off the dribble to draw fouls and to get all the way to the rim. Uh, Joel Embiid, when he was catching on his short roll, was being super physically aggressive to the rim to force the refs to blow the whistle. It wasn't grifty stuff. It was just physical aggression. He wasn't trying to draw fouls. He was just going hard to the rim and it was resulting in fouls. That to me is a way more (laughs) honorable way to get to the foul line. Um, But then they won the game on two critical threes and two critical stops. The first three was James Harden. I think it was Drew Holiday went underneath the screen. Now from way out, it was like a 28 footer, but James Harden rose up and knock down that three over the top of that uh, uh, of that ball screen. And then the second one, Joel Embiid with that pump fake and kind of reoriented himself and had a wide open three from the top of the key, and he knocked it down. They made the two shots, and then on the other end, they got two critical stops. The first one, um, uh, the Bucks ran a ton of Drew Giannis pick and roll down the stretch of this game, and you know the, uh, Giannis actually drew a couple fouls in the fourth quarter on lob passes, because it was kind of a tough predicament because, you know, Drew Holiday hit a short pull-up jump shot in the fourth quarter. So, uh, like, Joel's having to come out from his drop to contain the ball handler, right, which puts you in a tough spot on the back line. But on the first stop, um, after the James Harden three, if I'm getting my possessions correctly, he uh, Joel Embiid did a really impressive job of showing out to stop Drew from taking the three, but then sprinted back in time to force Giannis into a post-up rather than just a catch and finish. And he forced Giannis into a miss under the rim. It was an incredible defensive effort. And then after he hit the three to give him the lead, he just straight up switched the pick and roll onto Drew Holiday, which completely threw the Bucks off. They didn't even know what to do next because they were operating in that like pick and roll short roll situation the entire fourth quarter. And he slid his feet. Drew Holiday didn't kind of know what to do. And he ended up taking a tough contested three off the dribble. Joel got a good contest and he forced the miss. And, And that was the game. Um, so, you know, down the stretch of this game, J- uh, James Harden and Joel Embiid were the two best players on the floor. They made all the big plays on both ends of the floor. And that's why I haven't been able to write off Philly. Again, like, I'm not going to pick Philly to win the East. I'm going to pick probably Milwaukee or Boston, right? If Milwaukee or Boston end up in a playoff series against Philly in the second round, I will be picking Milwaukee or Boston, okay? But all season long, what I've told you guys is Philly has a real chance, If James Harden and Joel Embiid play this well, they can beat anybody. I'm skeptical too. Embiid's perimeter jump shot has fallen apart a few times. He's been exposed in some specific matchups with his foot speed. 
James Harden obviously has a long resume of struggling in the NBA postseason. I'm skeptical too. But if they play to this level in the postseason, they are talented enough to beat anybody. And we can't write them off. All right, guys, that's all I have for today. We're going to be back tomorrow covering Knicks Celtics, a little bit more from that Suns Mavs game and whatever. I'll have to look at the slate to see if there's any other interesting games tonight. Um, That show should be releasing in the early evening tomorrow. So keep an eye on the feeds. As always, I appreciate your guys' support and I will see you next time.